Um, my name is Kristen Nicardi. Um, I know some of you, but I'll introduce myself to those of you who don't know me. I work at Intel's Open Source Technology Center. Um, I've worked on the kernel for many years now. I think my first patch I sent was in like 2000 or something like that. So um, I've bopped around from subsystem to subsystem. Um, I've worked on uh, PCI. I used to do maintain the PCI hotplug subsystem. Um, I've worked on ACPI, power management, and uh, my newest incarnation of career is security. I'm part of the OTC security team. So today I'm going to talk to you uh, about some ideas we have for how to do some proactive defense against CPU side channel attacks. Uh, I'm going to let you read this offline at your leisure. <laughs> Tell me what it says. <laughs> OK, so um, the first thing I want to talk to you about is, is diversity. So um, this is a definition of a monoculture that I got off of um, Wikipedia. Um, I think we're all familiar with the idea of monocultures in agriculture and the kind of problems that they can present, um, such as the Irish potato famine. Um, we also are probably really familiar with the problems that it can present for computer infrastructures to the point where, you know, we have a definition on Wikipedia for uh, monocultures in computing. Um, the uh, Morris worm, which was in 1988, was probably like the most famous incident of how monoculture uh, software allowed a uh, malicious piece of software to travel very efficiently and quickly. So they've been, it's been a problem for a long time. So at this point, you're probably wondering, <laughs> what does this have to do with side channels? Um, so I assume at this point that everybody knows what a side channel is. Um, but I just want to like give you a definition so that I can highlight the part that I think that you should find important. <laughs> and that's that a side channel attack is any kind of attack that's based on information that you can get from a computer system that is a result of the computer system itself rather than any kind of weakness in the algorithm. So it's a way that information can get leaked rather than an exploit in and of itself. And they've been around for decades. I mean, we've, talked, we've had side channels against power systems and various other things. Um, and also, when you start looking at CPU microarchitectural side channels, those have actually been around for years as well, although they've gotten a lot of publicity this year. They have been a thing for a while, so they're not new. Uh, academics have been writing papers about them for years. So side channels, this is the key takeaway though, side channels in and of themselves aren't an exploit, they're often the first step in an exploit. So back to diversity. So what does this, why are we talking about it? It's because software diversity makes some side channels less useful. I think that it's a valid assumption at this point to, to assume that we're going to see CPU-based side channels for the foreseeable future. They're just going to keep coming. And so what we have to do is stop, stop pretending that we are going to be able to block all of them and start assuming that we need to start making them yet less useful or harder to use. So we have mitigations in place in the kernel today that block some of them, but obviously we can't have blocked everything. So being proactive means that we're not looking to address specific side channels or specific exploits. We're doing hardening. So this proposal I'm going to talk to you today is about hardening against future unknown exploits. So there's been a lot of academic research on software diversity. This is sort of a collection of the papers, some of the papers I found. I didn't put all of them. I just put a few until I got bored of making this slide. <laughs> the oldest paper, though, on this list is from the early 90s. And the newest paper is from this year. So obviously there's uh, been a lot of research and continues to be a lot of research in this area. However, most operating systems today have really only adopted one method of automatic software diversity, and we'll talk more about that later. But before I can talk to you about code diversification, diversification I want to give you a quick refresher on the ELF fo fo file format. Um, ELF is the format that's used most on Linux and most Unix systems. Um, it has sort of at the, at the highest level, it's got two 
basic formats. One of them is an executable, and the other one is a relocatable object format. Um, this is a really simple version so that it fits nicely on my slide. Um, but this <laughs> is the kernel's an executable format, and it's got sort of these main sections. It has a header where you, we, you use it to reference the other sections and get some information out of it. Um, and the, the, the part that we care about in this picture is the text section. Um, the text section is where your code is. That's where your executable code is. So the kernel is obviously a lot more complicated than this. In addition to um, the fact that I didn't list every single possible else section here, the kernel also makes special sections because fun, I guess. And <laughs> I don't even know what they all do. I expect I will soon, but <laughs> for now, these are the basics. And uh, we're going to focus on the text section. So. So when we start talking about code diversity, there's really two categories of things that you can, um, that you can talk about. One of them is uh, where is the level of randomization that you do. And um, in this, in this uh, slide, I've given you examples of where you can do randomization. So we can do randomization all the way at the instruction level. Um, we can reorder basic blocks. We've all, we all have known for a long time that basic blocks can be, certain basic blocks can be reordered and you retain your functionality. So this is obviously um, something that we can do. We can, at the function level, do some randomization. In fact, OpenBSD has a stack layout random randomization enabled for their kernel. Um, you can change the function parameters on the fly. I mean, obviously that would break certain things like CFI, but, but what the heck? <laughs> and there's all kinds of other things. Finally, you can do um, program level uh, randomization. So at the program level, you can do things like function reordering. You can do base address randomization. You can do um, some data randomization or you can do system call mapping randomization. And I'm sure there's more, but these are sort of like the biggies that I identified. The second place where we can categorize randomization approaches is when you apply the randomization. So this is kind of a diagram of the software life cycle. Um, vendor systems are the sort of the top part of the life cycle and user systems are the bottom. This shows you where these different steps happen. So vendor systems are obviously controlled by the distributor of the software, and the uh, install, load, execute, update, is, uh, it takes place on the user system. And those are user controlled. So most operating systems, as I mentioned, have implemented one type of randomization, and this is base address randomization. Um, for Linux, it's implemented in both user space and the kernel. And um, we also have a structure layout randomization if you actually use the GCC plugin that Case put in there. But um, these, so these are the two things that we have. And these are at, at the program level and we'll talk about why that's important later. So as far as when to randomize, um, ASLR works at load time. So every time you load uh, uh, a program and you have ASLR, Implement, uh, implemented, then the randomization takes place. So this is, this is kind of what kernel uh, randomization looks like today. So you can see here we have uh, on the left the address space that the kernel is located in, um, and then you have your little text section, which is probably bigger, but, <laughs> but um, the text section can move within this, within this fixed range. So the order within the text section is unchanged. It's still the same as it was when it was built, but as we load the kernel, we can, uh, we can adjust it within certain parameters. So the issue with ASLR as it is today is that it's pretty weak. I mean, even if you're talking about user space ASLR, it's a pretty weak defense. Um, the kernel in particular is extra weak because it has really low entropy, meaning there's only so many places where you can fit that text slot into that little space that we're, alloc that we're allocated for address space. So that means it's, it's possible to do brute force attacks to just figure out where the kernel is located. The other issue is that anytime you have any kind of info leak where a single address is revealed, the location of the entire text segment can be found. So that means that an attacker can construct an offline exploit in the comfort of their own home against some of the major 
distro kernels and just calculate where the offset is of their attack once they get onto the system. So at this point, you might be wondering, well, if ASLR is so weak, why don't we do more? Especially considering there's decades of research on this topic. So the issue is, is that monoculture has its benefits. The software ecosystem as it is today is actually um, built around monoculture. Um, they, this is the way that IT organizations work. They love monoculture because it makes their lives easier. If everybody's running the exact same software everywhere, it makes it easy to automatically deploy patches, it makes it easy to do, to do code verification, and it makes debugging easier. And this is why actually the ASLR has been as successfully deployed, is because it works within this structure. It allows you to keep all of the benefits of monoculture, but it adds just a little bit of load latency, and it takes place almost entirely on the user system, so there's no overhead uh, put onto the vendor to use it. So everything is kind of business as usual. So the question is, can we do any better given these restraints? And we're obviously not going to rototill the software ecosystem in order to add randomization. <laughs> so um, obviously, I think the answer is yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today. Um, but I just would like to caution you guys, uh, this is a work in progress. It's going to be a really long road to get to the final endpoint, and I want to make sure that you understand that we're trying to work incrementally here. So when I started looking at how can we do better with randomization, the first question I have to ask myself is when to randomize. So if we stick just like ASLR does with a load time randomization, this is really still very practical and a good decision because it allows the vendors to continue to use its existing distribution and code signing methods um, without any kind of modification. The other thing that we can do, which is very interesting, is we can do kind of a hybrid system where we add some metadata at build time but defer the actual randomization until load time. So I'll show you what that looks like as we get a little further along. So the next question to ask is, uh, what level of randomization are we going to do? Well, it looks very enticing to try to go for some of the lower level randomizations because obviously they have better entropy. The fact is, if we sort of stick with our plan of how not to um, ruin everything right away, <laughs> it's, it makes a lot of sense to stick with program level randomization. And, and the nice thing about this is that we can layer what we're doing on top of existing base address uh, randomization. So everything continues to work as it is, and now we have sort of two layers of support instead of just one. So I chose function reordering um, because conceptually it's very easy to understand. It, it doesn't cause, a, it's not very intrusive, and uh, it's something that we can do as a first step. So the last decision I made was, um, was really an effort to keep this small. So I decided to try to implement fine-grained randomization for modules as a first step. And the reason I did that is because initially it's going to be a lot less work. It's also going to allow us to constrain the changes that we make to individual make files. And um, that way we can sort of gradually add modules in as we prove that this as people get more comfortable with the feature. Um, the nice thing is that GCC actually already has support for a flag that will allow us to capture the metadata at compile time that we can then use at load time in order to do our randomization. And this is the dash F function sections flag. So if I go to my module make file, all I have to do is add this C flag dash F function sections and now suddenly all of my metadata gets generated for me. And the reason that that works is because modules are already relocatable objects. They're not executable formats. So they are going to retain the metadata that is generated through this function flag. Um, they are linked into the, they're basically linked on the fly whenever you load uh, a module into the kernel. So what does this look like? So on the left side is our relocate, relocatable format. Um, this is, uh, 
basically a lot like the, execution, the executable format, except it adds a little extra section in there, which is called the uh, relocation section. And um, you can see on the left, I've indicated there's one for the text section, you get one for your data section. And what it looks like when you apply this flag is basically GCC will break your text section up into individual functions. So now you'll have multiple text sections. So you can see here in my example, I've got two functions. Each function is broken up into its own section and each one of those has its own relocation section assigned to it. So I got a simple module example just to walk through this and make it a little bit more concrete. Here I have, uh, I have a module that's got three functions. One of them is an init function, but there's two that are gonna exist at runtime. Um, the first, the test module work queue function refers to the one up top. Um, and and uh, so I had to make, make it, because my um, test module is so stupid, I had to tell the compiler not to optimize it out. So that's what that mess is. <laughs> but um, anyway. So when I've compiled, what I've done is I've compiled the text module, I mean the test module, and we're looking at it with ReadElf. We've told ReadElf to show us the sections, and I've just cut out the text sections for you. So what you can see is that there's now three text sections, and the main text section there is got a size of zero because there's nothing in it. All of the, all of the code has been broken out into individual sections. And then again, if you look into the relocation section for the test module work queue function, you can see that it's referencing a symbol in the other text section, test module do work, and that it helpfully like gives its own um, symbol index and, and it references it by the text section name. So I just wanna give you a, a sort of a, a quick refresher on how relocations work. Um, the correct address of a symbol needs to be updated whenever you actually place the code into memory. Um, and so the relocation section that is included in the L file is really just gonna show you the offset of where to make the change and the name of the symbol whose address you need to update. So uh, in modules, this happens at load time. Uh, at compile time, what happens is, the, the, is we wind up with, this is using obj dump to just look at the file. You can see that my address of this symbol is all zeros. Uh, and, and what we're going to do at load time in the module code is then replace that with the correct address where we placed our new section. So you can easily see that we can move our functions anywhere. And as long as we know where they are, we can then go and do our relocation. So when you're compiling with function sections, the symbol table, which is where all of the symbols are kept, just references the individual sections, so where the fun functions are located. So they, again, this is just to show you that they can really be anywhere. And we don't have to change anything about how we're doing relocations in the kernel, because it all just works. So when you load a module into memory, this is kind of what it looks like. You have two main sections. There's a core section and there's an init section. The init section is thrown out after we call module init, and the core section is the section that lives on in the kernel. So your executable code that's not marked by init is located in the core section, and it's at the top, all in one section. We collect um, mostly text, but there's some miscellaneous other sections that are also executable that are stuck in there, and for, for my purposes, I'm going to treat them exactly like the text section. So we can apply our randomization to the executable section so that rather than have a, uh, a text section that is predictable, we can add some entropy to it. So after we apply randomization to this, it could look something like this if you have a whole bunch of functions. You know, they're basically um, uh, randomized within that one section. Okay, so you're probably wondering, how effective is this really? Um, well, it depends. Um, obviously, if you have a two-function test module, you are not going to get a lot of entropy out of this. <laughs> However, um, most, function, most modules don't have um, that few a number of functions. And like I mentioned, um, uh, modules are really not the end goal. Um, this is a way of 
improving the technology in a way that's controlled and making tiny steps. So we can do it on, on uh, modules even though modules isn't exactly where we want to be. But the good news is that we can expand this over time in, gen in general. So we may start with function reordering, and then eventually as time goes on, um, we could add something like basic block reordering. Um, there's no reason why they can't layer on top of each other. So let's take a look at our, our monoculture benefits um, when we're talking about uh, this, this proposal. Um, we continue to have ease of distribution. The vendor doesn't have to um, have any overhead. We can continue to use code signing. Um, there probably will be load and runtime overhead of the diversified um, binaries. Uh, we're going to have probably some changes to make how we do debugging and error reporting. And I think that tracing and live patching will still work but it's going to require some work. Um, I think that what we can do is find a way to make our randomization repeatable by saving the seed or something like that. So how will this work when we start going where we really want to go, which is to the kernel text? Um, I think what we need to do is, the, the issue with the kernel text is kernel is not the kernel is not a relocatable format. The compiler is going to throw out all of that nice function information um, and when it generates the final image. So what we're going to have to do is either write a plugin that will capture that metadata and store it into yet another special section, <laughs> or we can wrap, we can also write a linker around a, a, link, a wrapper around the linker or or something to capture that metadata before it gets thrown out. The good news is is that this method is actually actually not something that I invented, and it's something that's been deployed in the wild in a, a somewhat complex piece of software, and that is with the Tor browser. Um, there was a project called uh, Self Rando that one of the academic researchers made, and uh, Tor actually integrated it into their system. And the way that it works is they do function reordering exactly like this. They write, they have a little runtime binary that they use to sort of capture the start point of the program, and that's when they do their, their loader modifications that they need to do in order to apply the randomization. We won't, of course, have to do that since we already have a loader in the kernel. And all we really need to do is tack on the extra um, metadata um, and that, that we need in order to make sure we understand where the start and end of all the functions are. So I think it's doable. It's just something that we're, I'm deferring until later. So at this point, you might be snark, snarky and you're thinking to yourself, well, fine grind randomization is completely useless because JIT ROP. Um, how many people know what JIT ROP, ROP is? <laughs> A few. <laughs> so I'll tell you what it means. It means that rather than build your attack offline in the comfort of your own home when you know where the, the layout of, a, of a, your text section is, you can actually go out and download a helpful framework to generate uh, gadgets on the fly. So um, this is something where it really doesn't matter how much um, randomization you get. If you find an address for a single, uh, a single address, you can then have access to an entire page of gadgets that you can use to now construct your exploit. Um, luckily, with this, uh, we can actually combine what we're doing with execute-only memory in order to make a much stronger defense. So execute-only memory allows us to mark the um, code section as non-readable. Um, and now some of you are thinking, but hey, you can't do that on x86. But haha, -ha, that's not true. <laughs> you can do this on x86 in a certain way. You can do it in a guest. Um, so we have, uh, right now, the, the issue is, is that page tables have bits for present write and no execute, but you can't simultaneously have um, writable but unreadable, you can have writable. <laughs> but uh, the extended page tables will allow you to have separate bits, and so it, it lets you represent what we need to do. There's a lot of complications now to this, um, not the least of which is that 
there's um, function pointers in data, there's probably going to be data in the text section that exists, so marking that as, um, as a, is going to be hard. And also, we might have to provide a way to turn it on and off in order to enable things like k-probes to continue to work. But um, we're pretty sure this is a solvable problem, and we're working on this in combination with fine-grained randomization to have a really pretty good story on code reuse prevention for guests. So here are a few resources if you're interested. I only listed like five papers that I thought were really interesting. There's like a zillion if you go out and Google them all. Um, in particular, if you could look at the self-rando one, that's, that's the one, and unfortunately, I think I didn't. Oh yeah, there it is, self-rando. That's the best one. Well, best by my definition, meaning most practical thing I could imagine being deployed anywhere. Um, I also have a POC. Um, which works by some definition of work right now. I can uh, load a module, it randomizes, it, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't hang with the doing nothing. <laughs> it's still um, under development. Um, the, most, uh, the things that are missing from it are um, mainly the ability to uh, consistent, to sort of predictably randomize, if you know what I mean, in order for us to start, start, start making live patching work. So there's still a lot of work to do, but if you want to take a look, it's surprisingly little code to make this work. I, mean, I think the, the amount of code that I had to write in order to get this to work was maybe less than 30 lines of code. Um, so it's very simple and straightforward. So um, I have left time for questions if anybody has any. Hi, my question is if we're going uh, to save the seat in order to be able to debug, uh, if I get the seat via side channel attack, which we know they exist, what will, have, what will stop me to hijack the whole memory of the system? Yeah, nothing. If you get the seed, that's the end of that. Um, I mean, it's sort of like the other thing that you have to think about is the symbol table, right? I mean, if you get the symbol table, you get everything too. Now you get your new nice um, layout. So there's going to be a lot of things we're going to have to protect. I think that we can look at strategies for how to keep the seed safe. For example, maybe we could put it in the TPM or something like that. So, uh, you know, uh, obviously the seed is going to be a precious thing that we're going to have to keep secret. Okay, and my other question is, uh, usually I'm not worried about that uh, someone will steal my text sections. I'm worried about that someone will steal my stored secrets in memory. Your what? Your my, my stored secrets in memory, for example. Oh, your data. You're worried about your data. Yeah, that's a different problem to solve for sure. So um, I know that Intel's been working on CET. The spec has been out for some time now. Control execution, uh, forget the, what CET stands for, but um, I think the idea is to prevent drop in hardware by uh, preventing where you can jump to or jump from. So is this, so the, the technology you're talking about is likely to apply only to the current generation of processors. I guess going forward, CET would be the way to prevent drop. So there's, I think that CET and other control flow technologies are in some sense solving a different problem and they can be used uh, complementary. Um, I think it remains to be seen whether all aspects of control flow technology would work with this. I, I'm not sure enough about whether the shadow stack stuff would still work, but um, I think it would. Uh, so I, I, I think that they would, they would uh, they'd be complementary. So thanks for the talk. I, I can easily see it's preventing like return to libc or return oriented programming kind of attacks. But since you're mentioning side channel attacks, I was wondering whether you have some specific microarchitecture or architectural vulnerability that your technique can prevent. So side channels in and of themselves aren't attacks. They're, they're info leaks. So think of them like that. And if you think of them like that, then you can see that although, of course, we want to stop info leaks, um, you can also do hardening against the exploits that people build on top of side channels. And so that's what this proposal is doing. 
The um, applying this to the kernel has been resisted in the past because of performance. It's pretty highly tuned, particularly that structure randomization stuff, which blows cache lines and all kinds of things. Have you thought about that? I have thought about this, and and and. This is why I really like doing function reordering, is because you can apply it to certain um, sections of the kernel and not to others. Like, there's no reason why you can't have a text section that continues to exist that isn't a zero size. Like in the example I gave you, it was completely eliminated, but it doesn't have to be. And so what we can do is we can sort of chip away at the code that we randomize, but we don't have to do it all at once. We can do it a little bit at a time. And uh, I think that if you find, if we find some code in there that really relies on either, you know, cache, uh, cache line alignment or locality, then we can address it individually. But in general, um, like when you think about how they lay out a text section, the only thing that's really guaranteed to be a page aligned is, is kind of like the, the function that exists at the top of the page, so. <laughs> well, yeah, that was my other question, packing. I mean, yeah. you're, you're not gonna be quite as tightly packed as it might have been in the object format, right? Uh, well, in the, in the algorithm that I'm using today, I actually use the exact same amount of space as what was used oh, okay. um, before. So it doesn't, it doesn't increase uh, anything in memory. It does increase the footprint of the file because you're now adding metadata to the um, binary. But um, as far as memory footprint, it doesn't change it. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Len. So um, yeah, it was also the question regarding performance, but about debugging, how the symbols, it's, do you have any plan for fixing the disturbance that it's going to generate these in terms of debugging once we have that? So my thought, the, the way that the self-rando project addressed this was by writing basically a uh, wrapper around the error reporting tool that they were using for the Tor browser in order to basically de-randomize before generating the report. That's something that we can do inside the kernel. Um, I'm not. I haven't convinced myself that I actually need to do this. I need to take a look at, you know, how, how do people even look at this? Because, for example, take a look at a stack dump today. The, the, the part that would be really messed up, I think, is, uh, you know, you get a stack dump if the address isn't in your, um, it, it isn't in your symbol table. It tries to guess where it thinks that it might be. I think, I'll, and you see that referenced as, you know, question mark, question mark, question mark, you know, symbol name. Um, I think those are going to be all bogus and wrong, but uh, it's, I think this is a solvable problem, especially if the seed is saved somewhere. We should be able to de-randomize before we spit out any debug info. Nope. All right. Thank you very much.